Hello, friends, and welcome back to Thespians, a series on the Movie Pope podcast where we talk to theater professionals and fans of dramatic literature. Um, but before we dive in, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and be sure to share this video with everybody that you know, because sharing is caring, and we are looking to grow our audience. So today we have Melissa Dombrowski of the Stone Soup Theater Company out of the Triangle in North Carolina, um, which is roughly about three to four hours away from my neck of the woods here in Charlotte. Um, Melissa, how are you doing on this fine, stormy Saturday afternoon? We're doing just fine. It's uh, it's a little boomy outside, but other than that, it's kind of nice to have a little rain to break up the heat. Well, you know, well, you know what? I, I, in a weird way, I sort of enjoy the gloominess because it reminds me of fall. Um, yeah. And I and I am a fall baby. And if, if you live if you live here it, it, in the Charlotte area, a lot of the great you know great festivals come out during the fall. You know, Greek festival, <laughs> Renaissance festival pumpkin patches, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, you know, and being a theater person, I prefer uh, working in the dark. So anything that <laughs> hides the sun for a while, I'm happy about. Remember, she, just just be aware, she's not a vampire. She just loves the theater a lot. So. Just love the theater. <laughs> so, uh, so, so Melissa, um, I, I was doing a little bit of research about Stone Soup Theater mm -hmm. Company before, um, before um, we started recording. And I got to say, the, it, it's just so fascinating that you guys name yourself after um, a well-known children's story. And as I was reading about it, I, it, it took me back to 1996 when I first read it in school, mm -hmm. um, you know, back when I had hair and it wasn't turning <laughs> white. And it, 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 it just made me wonder, like, what was it about Stone Soup that that inspired you to name your theater company after? Was it just the spirit of generosity or the fact that it was just such a weird story name? <sighs> Um, it's about collaboration. So if I can give you a, a, a short version of what the, the story is, um, basically it's a, a, a traveler comes into town, everybody in the town um, is very poor, they don't have things to share, he comes to a house, knocks on the door and, you know, asks for some food and they say, no, I can't help you, he does that for a few doors. And then he has an idea and he grabs a stone off the ground and he goes to another house and knocks. He says, excuse me, I've got this magic soup stone and uh, all I need to borrow is a kettle. And if you do, I'll share my soup with you. And uh, so he gets the kettle and then he goes to another house and says, you know, I'm making soup with my magic soup stone. I have a kettle. I don't know if you happen to have any onions. And if you do, you put that in, I'll share my soup with you. And uh, people, you know, they have an onion, they have a bay leaf, somebody's got a little bit of potato and people start getting curious and they come out and they bring what they have. And um, it results in a, a beautiful soup that is uh, made up of the small bits everybody can bring in and then everybody enjoys the benefits that come from that collaboration. And um, that's why we picked the name. We are, we're poor. Um, and uh, we we need our community to work. All of us can bring what we can bring. Um, nobody can bring the entire soup. And uh, but at the end of the day, we enrich our community from what we make together. And and, and, and that's so fascinating too, because I've interviewed you, you know theater directors of these small these smaller theater companies, and what I find so what I find so fascinating is the fact that. You know, they're, you know, the common theme is that they're all dealing with limited resources, but right. they find a, but they find a way to make it work. Like for, yeah. like for instance, Caleb um, from the Waxhaw Theater Company, they don't have a fixed space. They just move. Right. They're, they're pretty much moving around from space Neither to space. Neither do we. But the community is just so generous and so supportive of their work. Um, can, can, can you talk about like what prompted you? To, to form Stone Soup in the first place. Sure, um, and I and I will say that what's important with these kinds of community theaters is that um, it takes many people doing a little bit to make oh, it yeah. work. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, um, but sure, how, how we started it. Um, I, uh, it was during the pandemic and uh, I had been pre-pandemic hired to be artistic director for a, a lovely group called the Durham Savvy Yards, which uh, puts on a, um, a Gilbert and Sullivan opera each year at the Carolina Theater. And um, that same year was the first year their new music director was going to start. And of course, pandemic hit. And um, then 
so we're waiting and waiting to start this show. And um, but to keep their grants, they had to produce something. So uh, Joseph Purvis, who founded the Stone Soup with me, um, it was the music director, and we figured out a way to create um, to do an opera online. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, uh, it was a combination of Zoom, Vocaroo, uh, creating online spaces. Uh, Joe hand mixed everything audio. It, it was really tough. And, uh, but it kept us all working on something artistic during a very difficult time when, um, when we all desperately needed it. And we realized uh, before we even met in person that if we could do that, we could do anything. And um, she and I both have a huge love of theater and a big love of musical theater. And, uh, and so we decided that we would, once the pandemic lifted, we would come together and, and see if we could get some theater going. And um, for the first two years, we did theater exclusively outdoors. And that was also very difficult. Um, but uh, we've since moved indoors, which is nicer, because uh, we don't have to strike the full show after the show every evening. And um, uh, that's that's kind of where we started. We were trying to fill fill in a hole. And um, since then, I would say theater has really fully recovered in the triangle. There is a there are a lot a lot of theater companies and a lot of excellent theater happening. But we were one of the first groups to kind of jump in as, as soon as we were allowed to be outside and masked and around other people, because we were really hungry for that kind of social interaction. Well, I, well, I, I imagine too, like, you know, the very beginnings were, were, were quite difficult just because not only were you coming up the tail end of a pandemic, but financially everybody was pretty much <sighs> Oh yeah. Yeah. So 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 how are you able to you know you know to work with very little resources, you know, for the first first few months or even year? Sure. So we underwrote things. We got some people who would loan us a few thousand dollars on the idea that if they couldn't be paid back, oh well. Um and then we also used the cheapest venues we could possibly find. Uh, we basically performed the first two years in a park, uh, which meant, again, we had to set up our set and our lights and our sound every day before the show and then fully strike it every night after the show, <laughs> um, which is doing theater on hard mode. Um, but uh, but that location only cost us a hundred dollars a day to use, and um, so that was was feasible. Also, right out of the pandemic, uh, the rights to certain shows were a lot lower, just because they were hoping anybody would put anything on. Those have since recovered, um, but uh, that's that's kind of how we made it work. Um, lots of borrowing, lots of begging. Now, what about um, what about getting? Uh, getting the crew and the talent. Again, um, we are really fortunate where we live. There is a lot of talent in the area. Um, and a lot of, uh, it, because we are in an area with, with several universities around it, you have a lot of people who have done theater at some point, um, and sometimes professional theater in New York, and then decided that that's not where they wanted to raise their kids. And they've moved here for the job market or what have you. Um, there's a really incredibly talented group of non-equity actors and non-IATSE uh, people who, who tech people um, who are willing to, to, to work for the joy of it, uh, provided that you keep the, um, the whole process joyful. Uh, that's a really important part about com community theater. It has to serve the community. You have to serve the people who are providing those services. It has to be fun for everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's what I find find interesting is the fact that you know you're you're really you're very much relying on the generosity of others. Yes. Um, because they're not, and because there's no incentive for them to do it really. Um, mm -hmm. well, well, let me rephrase that. There's no financial incentive for there them it to is. do it. So. <laughs> So, you know, you know, so so it's one of those things where you kind of, you know, you kind of have to go on the charm offensive and and, and just mm -hmm. and just well, 
I wouldn't say sell it to them, but kind of make them believe in, you know, in the, in the process. Right. So, so, so you did mention um, something, um, something a few seconds ago about um, about professionals moving to the Triangle area. Can mm -hmm. you talk? Can you talk about what the theater scene is like in in the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area? Because mm -hmm. it, it's it, it's it's such a it's such a huge academic hub, right? Yeah. In North Carolina, y you don't really you don't really associate it with theater because it's because it's more the theater would be seen more of something you either see in the big city like Charlotte, for instance. Or in a more, I, I guess, in a more youthful, hip environment like you would in Greensboro, which is where I went to school. So right. maybe, so maybe go into what it's like living, um, living in that area, what the theater scene is like, and what do you, what are you guys doing to kind of make Stone Soup, you know, appealing to, to that demographic in that area? Sure. So um, first of all, uh, there is um, for a for a place that you wouldn't probably consider as a theater hub like new york or washington dc chicago or or los angeles san francisco uh there's a surprising amount of um of different sort of theaters including professional work uh playmakers repertory which is uh loosely based on on um well it's on the unc campus and uh but i I don't know. I don't know if they're the only Lort theater in North Carolina, but they—if they, they aren't—they're one of the very few. Uh, and they are, um, in addition to doing, you know, one musical and a classical play every year, they're producing new works, and it's—it's it's very innovative. It's a—it's a wonderful theater. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that is—that's equity with some non-equity roles. Uh, there are um, a couple of kind of peri professional theaters in the area that do bring in equity actors. Um, uh, recently, we've got um, Enract in North Raleigh uh, that is paying actors. Um, so we've got that level. We also have in Durham the Durham Performing Arts Center, which is one of the I, it's either top five or top ten. Um, performing venues in the United States. And it, it gets all of the um, the Broadway tours kind of on their first year as they go through. It's a really spectacular facility. So we've got high quality Broadway theater coming in as well. And then there is um, a robust and diverse community of, of, of community theaters. Raleigh has probably the most of them. Um, Raleigh Little Theater was part of the Little Theater mu movement that came out of the, the early 20th century and uh, has been around forever. Um, I spoke a little bit about uh, the Durham Savoyards and they're over 60 years old. Uh, the But there are other companies that have been established for 20, 30 years, Burning Coal, Justice Theater Project, um, and then a lot of new companies because we've got these again, robust universities around us. And these students are coming up and creating things. And um, uh, so people are absolutely finding ways to work and, and, uh, and create. The biggest problem I think facing all of us is venue space, uh -huh. <laughs> trying, to, trying to find any sort of, of space that is affordable is very, very difficult. Um, so that's, that is really the the biggest issue facing all of us right now but there is a lot of work um if anybody in my area is looking to audition you just go to the facebook group triangle auditions and there's something new posted at least three times a week it's it's there's a lot to be done so uh, so so you mentioned that that you guys don't have a fixed space right is, is there like a I, I guess is there, is there like a like a regular home base that you guys operate out of, or is it mainly, or is it just mainly a digital presence? And then once you have everything organized, that's when you go and get a space. How, how does that work? So it's it's moving and changing as 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 again the space is. Gosh, sorry. Let me step back. Um, the the environment here is changing very rapidly. Uh, rent prices are going up exponentially, uh, which reflects how much we are asked to pay for spaces. Um, the So we know that we don't want to do things outside if we don't have to, because again, that was incredibly difficult. Um, 
but we had a space last year that we tried to use, but their prices kept increasing and, and essentially took all of our profit. Um, so we weren't able to save for more productions in the future, which is an important part of our, our plan longevity. Uh, so right now, we are currently looking at trying to secure our own space somewhere that is, um, we're looking in Hillsborough currently, uh, and very, very early stages to see who's willing to go in with this, who might partner with us on this space, if we can share it with other theater companies, um, if we can attach it to like a music school or something. And um, uh, to try and just figure out a way so we can have a home. Having a home makes this a lot easier to do. You're right now, all of our items live in my garage. Um, we rehearse uh, by the grace of <laughs> the grace of God um, at a wonderful school, the Carolina Friends School. It's a Quaker school, and they they allow us to. This is great. They allow us to rehearse there for thirty five dollars a day, um, which is unheard of. Most of the other rehearsal spaces want ninety dollars an hour. Uh, it's it's incredibly expensive uh, to produce theater and it's getting worse. So um, we're trying to figure out a good footprint and um, our hope is that in a year to a year and a half, we will have our own roof and then we can help other companies also find a reasonable, affordable way to house their productions. So have you, um, I know you mentioned this already, but um, have, have you have you talked to other theater companies about possibly collaborating or yeah. joining forces to kind of make this happen? Yeah, it's, as I said, it's really early days yet, but yes, we've been okay. reaching out. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So um, I do want to shift gears a little bit because, um, because I was on your website earlier yep. and I was looking at I was looking at the season for this year yeah. um, and, and, and you've got you've got a pretty good selection here. So, so the first thing that stands out to me is Godspell. Yes, um, I'm casting it tomorrow. <laughs> oh, so so um, so that leads me to another question. Can you talk about like what what is the process like? Be, you know, being, you know, a, a small theater company, what is the process like for selecting what shows you're going to go to a theater and how do you go about securing these rights? Because I, because for, for a show like Godspell, I imagine, you, you know, you would need to have a substantial amount of money, you know, just in case. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know. Yeah. So, um, selecting the season. So first of all, we are going into our fourth season and what we've done each season is increase our season by one show. So season number one had one show, season number two had two, season three had three shows. This year we have four. Yeah, our goal, sense. yep, our goal is to end with five shows. And uh, admittedly, especially in the early days, it was basically just Joe and I asking each other, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, which is great. I mean, self-producing uh, is, is frightening for so many ways, but it's liberating to be able to just do what you'd like to do. Um, we, uh, our board has since grown and uh, we had other considerations to take. The um, one of the biggest, and this is an important thing for Stone Soup, is that we, we use live musicians and um, musicians have to be paid. They may not be paid very much, but you can't get away trying to find a quality orchestra without paying something because right, people right. have to spend eight, 10, 12 years of their lives perfecting their instruments. So it's a, it's a skill set that you may not get from your actors on the stage. And um, so that's always been a big cost. This year, uh, we made sure that we picked shows with small orchestras. So, you know, Godspell is going to be a total of maybe four musicians. Guys on Ice is one. Um, Good Man Charlie Brown is one to three. And um, as opposed to previous seasons where we had a, a full 12 piece orchestra. Right. And, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting lost a little bit. Um, the, so we picked those. We also tried to pick um, some shows that had a broader appeal. Uh, you know, last year, those the, you know, I I'm I'm drawn to plays that are um, a little darker. I loved doing cabaret. Uh, we also did a show called Ride the Cyclone, which is a, a dark comedy musical that begins with six teenagers uh, being beheaded as they're on a um, 
roller coaster that goes off the tracks. <laughs> and, um, and that's the opening scene. And, and it's a comedy musical. Um, but uh, so just kind of looking at knowing that we were not going to have a, a one particular home, we were looking this year specifically for small shows with small orchestras and um, trying to keep that that budget as tight as we can while we are actively working on finding and creating a space. So, you know, so, you know, so obviously you've got to take a lot of things into consideration mm -hmm. um, when choosing when choosing the right show. Obviously, how many musicians um, you know, would be needed, you know, is, is one of them. Also, making sure that they conform to, or 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 or, or, or at least you know, or they're at least you know friendly to a small budget. You know, is, yeah. is another and 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 that makes sense because. You know, because from a film standpoint, you definitely want to take all the all, all the logistics into consideration mm -hmm. before figuring out how to go about planning and producing and shooting a film. Right. So I I, I, to I totally get where you're coming from because what you're doing is the equivalent of what an what a student or indie filmmaker would be doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Except we do it live. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you don't you don't have the luxury of like uh, of, of like doing multiple takes to get it right. Right. So. So it does lead me to my next question. So, so are most of your shows musicals, or have you considered, or or would you ever consider doing like plays, like they regular plays? They have been up till now, largely because again, my partner Joe is a music director. Also, uh, musicals are hard, and a lot of local theater companies maybe put on one or two a year. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's it's something that she and I are good at. Uh, that said, last year we did our first uh, musical production. We did a production of Romeo and Juliet, where um, and this was such an interesting uh, take on it. They reversed the ages so that Romeo and Juliet were elderly people in a care home, and they um, they were exploring how we infantilize people as they grow older where their children were cre creating and trying to control those relationships. Um, and it was a really interesting way to explore power and control in that family dynamic. Um, so that was really cool. And this year we're also going to be doing the importance of being earnest. So uh, we're, we're kind of dipping our toes in. It's much cheaper to produce uh, non-musicals, but fewer people come. So, again with the whole venue being our largest expense by far uh it, it's a it's a challenge to kind of fit in and be able to afford plays that don't pull in as many people as a musical even if it's easier to produce so basically the idea is high risk high reward right 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 mm -hmm. okay gotcha gotcha so so this so this is a question that i've asked um other theater directors and and and, and, I, and I feel like at this point it's it's an uh, obligatory question. Have you have you considered or have you th thought about um, you know op you know opening the theater to you know to possibly collaborating with you know with with playwrights or musicians? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That is a major major goal for us. Um, and again, that's one of those that will be easier once we have our own space. Um, again you are able to rehearse in a specific space you can have evenings where we're doing play readings where we're 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 mounting workshops um that is part of our long-term goal uh we very much very much want to work with local artists in creating new works yeah because yeah because that that part of north carolina the triangle does have a pretty a pretty good art scene because um oh yeah and the I mean, author I, I, mean, I mean james taylor for you know grew up in the carver area so yeah and and uh there's so many authors out here and there are playwrights and there needs to be a place for these to be mounted and it's exciting to mount new works that nobody else has worked on and uh but again the the thing is about the risk so you know, if I'm in a location where to rent it for one week cost me $5,000, I can't put on a new play nobody has heard of in that space. We will never make that back. Um, but if I have another location 
that we own. And on Tuesday nights, it's normally dark and we turn that into a playwriter symposium and do play readings and workshop things and then maybe mount that in between other productions. That's doable. And that's another part of serving our community. Well, another thing too is, is the fact that you guys are, are located in an area um, where three of the biggest universities in the state and the country mm -hmm. Are located. I mean, you've got Duke University, you got Chapel Hill, and you got NC State. That's right. Are you um? Are, how are you? How are you guys collaborating, or how are you guys working with the you know with the arts community at these universities to kind of generate interest and possibly scout or w collaborate with you know with these young and up and up and coming talents? So there is some difficulty, uh, in part because the universities are very insular. Um, so the people who are currently students at these universities do have access to better performing places, rehearsal spaces. They don't necessarily need themselves to collaborate outside um, because they have the resources to produce and do their theater within their own departments, which as well they should be able to. Um, where we tend to overlap and collaborate is uh, in casting. A lot of the actors will want to do work outside of the theater. Um, I've also been reaching out, trying to find new directors or, or people wanting to um, uh, be lead designers who are from these programs. Um, because while we don't pay very much, we do pay at least a little bit of a stipend. So it is professional, um, poor, but professional. And, um, and so, we we work in that respect, but um, it is entirely possible for somebody at, at UNC or Duke or NC State to do lots of theater and never have to step into their community. Um, but they're always welcome. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 I and I just think it's so important to you know to not only you know work within the um, the institution itself, but also kind of. Get outside and do some work out there. Kind of like, kind of like an yeah. intern, really. You know, a hundred percent. And and I also want to point out NCCU, which is a historical black college. Um, right, and, right, right. And Meredith University, which is an all girls college, um, who by the way produced some of the best female uh, theater technicians and designers. Um, so really. Yeah, no, the girls from Mel Meredith are amazing. I did, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, so there's even there's even more in this area, um, and that's part of what we try to do is is um, you know we want to especially once people are in college, give them an opportunity to um, to do things that are going to add to their portfolio. And that's that's the most important thing. Um, right, right. They, they may accept beer money in exchange, but the the portfolio is all important. But, uh, but another thing too, is the fact that, you know, you've got four, maybe maybe six years if you do a master's, uh, mm -hmm. years, years on campus. And after that, I mean, you're out on your run. You can't really stay yeah. in that, you know, stay in that, um, that area for, forever. So no. I figured. So I figured at some point, like, you know, they, they would start looking around the area and say, "Well, where else can I take my talents to now that I've outgrown, mm -hmm. or you know, or the university no longer needs me?" Well, you know, people who are working on their, like at UNC, if you're working on your master's at their university, you are enrolled as part of uh, playmakers. So that Lort Theater, you're getting your equity card. You're going to be doing that work, not the community theater work. Um, so, you know, we probably do not get a lot of engagement for people who are at that point doing their master's. Also, getting a master's in, in theater, um, there are very few positions for it, and they often require you to have teaching assistantships, and so you, you are fully engaged in that university. The most, the, the largest uh, group of people from universities we work with are probably undergrads who are looking for agency and a chance to uh, really work as artists in their own right without a teacher overlooking them or what have you. And and that's a place that we can help. Well, another thing too, because um, because on the website, I saw that you guys have a fellowship program. Mm -hmm. can, you, um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
The Ken and Gloria Crabe Fellowship, uh, Future Theater Leaders Fellowship, is named after my parents, who both passed um, around the pandemic. And um, uh, they were amazing people who supported me in theater and who also helped fund theater and who worked backstage in theater. And um, the goal is to provide teenagers, so high school students, with the opportunity to progressively uh, improve in their craft by kind of uh, working on two to three shows over the span of a year and having a professional mentor. And the idea is that the first show, first kind of two shows they work on, the mentor is going to be very heavy in uh, helping them learn how to do the job and and do what they're doing but by the third show they are working independently and after that we uh if that student decides to work for us again we will we'll again pay them peanuts but we'll pay them what we'd pay an adult and um it's a wonderful way for technical students to get practical uh, experience and then to also develop themselves and their own vision as artists. So can, can you talk about what what is the um, criteria like for selecting and uh, I, I guess accepting a candidate into the fellowship mm -hmm. program? Because I'm assuming there, there are certain prerequisites, certain qualifications that you're looking for in a candidate. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, um, they need to be hardworking and they, they need to want to do this. Uh -huh. um, it's not easy work. Um, the They should be organized. They should, um, we're really looking for people who want to do this in college. Um, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, for us, we, we do an essay, we ask for, for references, and we do a meeting. And, um, and then, we're happy to teach and that's important in both helping uh, create more skilled technical and designers as we go forward. Um, but also it speaks, um, it speaks a lot to, to kind of me and my journey. Uh, I, I began my theater career thinking I was going to be a triple threat and I was until I was doing, um, I was doing a version of Beauty and the Beast and I was playing Belle and I had 160 performances of it to do over the span of a summer. And it was number 116 that I actually fell asleep on stage. I oh, was, wow. <laughs> I know, it's okay, I woke up in time, um, but I was so bored. <laughs> and I realized, I realized that, um, a lifetime of doing cats was a special kind of hell that I did not want to do. And uh, so, you know, a successful Broadway career was not going to engage me. I was a process girl. I mm -hmm. like creating and starting and working on things and then moving on. Um, and without that experience, I wouldn't have realized that, no, I want to, I want to do the process. I want to be a director. Uh, and these students who are kind of going through that and realizing it, I want to make sure that they've got as much of a, a support network. And frankly, teens are so freaking savvy these days and creative and they bring a lot. Um, there should be a place for them. In, but you in also, creative. but at the same time, you also want to be honest with them as well, because you don't want to sell them on this idea that it's, you know, all, all fun and games and they, <laughs> They commit mm -hmm. like twenty, like sixteen hours to, a, a day to making sure that you know everything works and nothing goes wrong. Because oh yeah, because I mean, one hundred and sixty shows in one summer. Good lord! Like I'm, su I'm surprised mm -hmm. you managed to, you managed to make it this long without going going nuts. Yeah, no, I did go nuts though. <laughs> well, you, well, you also fell asleep too. So. I did. I fell asleep <laughs> on the stage. I mean, my character was the sleeping, and that was I was very tired. Um, but, uh, so, 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 so really, I, so really, if anybody asks, you could just say, well, you know, I am that devoted to my craft, you know, yeah, I am yeah. that, I, I am, I am that serious of an actor. I was, I was methoding all the way. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I took Stanislavski and I literally <laughs> slept on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, 
but no, it was it was uh, oddly enough a wake up call. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> Both, yes, in every way possible. So um, so so I I, I do want to um dive a little bit into into your backstory because um because you know, because I, I was looking at your CV on on the mm -hmm. website and you you actually um went to uh Merry Old England to get your degree in um, drama mm -hmm. and theater studies. So can you can, can you talk about like what was the journey like for you to decide you know theater was was the right choice for you and how you ended up going sure. to going to England? Sure. So um I I knew by high school that this is what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I applied to several colleges and this was back before universal applications. So you had to type all of your essays on a typewriter and send them individually to every location. So, you know, you only applied to three schools and not the, the 30 or 40 that kids do these days. Um, that's how old I am, kids do these days. Uh, so <laughs> I got accepted to CSU Sacramento on a full scholarship for theater mm -hmm. and, um, free college was the right price. And so I went and, um, and it was okay. Uh, there were, <laughs> there were some really great people in the department. Um, but for the most part, uh, I I found it challenging to only be in class for an hour at a time, three days a week. Uh, I I felt it, it was kind of like high school, but with ashtrays. Um, I I didn't feel really challenged by it, and I remember one day in my second year, rather than walking to a script analysis class, which is funny because I did terribly in that class, but I love script analysis now. Um, I zigged when I normally should have zagged, went to <laughs> the international uh, exchange place and said, hi, I need to study somewhere else and I'd like to go to England. And they said, well, there is no program exchange between the school and any school in England. And I said, well, I'm going to stay here till we make one. And uh, and I showed up five days a week every day, making a nuisance of myself until um, they worked with me to find a school that would be willing to take me on as an exchange student for a year. So I was the first person in that exchange. and um, And I went and it was transformative. So uh, I went from the equivalent of a, of a BA program in the US to a BFA program in the UK. Um, the class structure there was you met once a week and your classes were between four to eight hours long. And uh, three classes was a full load. So after three days, I had done all of my my in class work. I could study. I could do theater. I could bartend. Um, I could go see all of the theater in the West End. It was amazing. It was a wonderful, poor, poverty stricken time of my life. It was so <laughs> much ramen eaten. I, I eschewed protein to to buy more tickets, and um, uh, and I loved it. And when I finished my year, I had to send everything back to the US to to have that um, those classes translated so I could get credit. And Sac State wrote to me and said, sorry, looking at these, these are master's levels classes. We cannot give you credit for them for your bachelor's degree. What? So yeah, yeah. No, even kidding. But I could apply uh, them to my master's. What? Okay, 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 okay. That makes absolutely no sense. I mean, no. I, I, I have taken, I, I have taken, I, I have taken five hundred and six several hundred level uh -huh. classes, uh -huh. and they applied to my bachelor's. Are you? Are, I'm not even kidding. Oh my I, god. I, yeah, yeah. It sounds, and, it sounds like they're being petty. That's what it sounds oh, like. Oh, uh, well, a hundred percent. They were, they were just going to try and keep me for another two years. Um, and I went to the dean of students in Britain, and because uh, we were really small, I mean, our classes were only sixty people large. And uh, I said, "That's just what the U.S. is wanting to do to my degree." And he says, "Well, bring me your transcripts and your resume. Let's talk." And I brought it to him, and he looked through all of that, and he says, "You only need one more history class to get a degree." 
And so uh, I officially transferred <laughs> at that point. So my, my first year there was covered under my scholarship. My second, I, I had to pay for one semester. But uh, I took that history class and then a wonderful Shakespeare class and, and a, 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 oh my God, a great design class that just changed my mind, blew my mind. Um, and I graduated with a BFA in three and a half years, rather than if I'd come back to the US, it would have been five. So yeah, I jumped ship. <laughs> I mean, but that's the thing about the English curriculum, because because from what I've seen and read, they, they put a lot of focus on independent work and independent study. Oh, yeah. Um, the first time I I submitted an essay, and I, and I remember it was about, um, it was about Peter Brook. And um, uh, and I, I had written an essay that in the US I was certain would have gotten an A. And I got it back with an average mark. And uh, again, for the US, our, our focus on, on that kind of education is A is I've, I've hit all the marks, not exceptional. It's just, I've hit all the it's, things. It's rote learning, basically. It's like, as long as, yeah. as, long as you say the right things, you're good to go whereas yeah you know, whereas with the whereas with the, the european it's you know model it's more of critical thinking right you and know? i i went back to him and i said why did i get this subpar grade he says well you only told me what they said in the book what do you think and it was the first time anyone in university had asked me what i thought and mm -hmm. i had to relearn like i had to learn that what it was required of me was critical thinking and it was brilliant. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. It, like actual critical thinking, not not yes. the lip service they they say in all the job applications. It, yeah, it was exactly. Uh, it it was a whole a whole degree higher of of requiring of me. It was challenging and thrilling, and you know, I I ended up graduating with with above average grades, but not exceptional. But I, I treasure those above average grades more than I would have if I'd gotten honors in the US. Well, because well, 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 I was going to say, like, I mean, because they do what, like the first, second and third honors. Yes. Over there, mm -hmm. don't they? Yes. And okay. I had a I had a two one. So, now, if, if I so had so 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 that would have give that would have been the equivalent of what a cum laude uh, here? Three, three, three point seven. Yeah, okay. three point six, three point seven. Um, if you get a one one though, you can go straight to your PhD. So it's kind of really? cool. Yeah, oh. yeah. No, it's the way to go. Also, their masters only take one year. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I because I for for a long time I considering you know getting a master's degree from the UK, but mm -hmm. um, but after a while it's like ah uh, I don't know I don't I don't know if I've got the <laughs> skills. Plus, I kept waffling. I didn't know if I wanted to do like political communication or political theory, and then I uh, kind of lost interest after that. <laughs> well, you know, and it, of course, it costs it costs more, but um... true, true. But you are getting, but to, but to your um, but to your point, I mean, you are getting good value for your money. You know? Absolutely. I mean, what I what I was doing at in Sacramento was checking off boxes to get a degree. What I did in Britain was teaching me. You and actually changed, got an education. Yeah, and it changed me as an artist. So, 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 you know, you graduate from, you know, from Middlesex University in England. Mm -hmm. You come back to the U.S. What happens after that? Like, where do you go from there? Um, really, a lot of dead end jobs. Uh, <laughs> so, which is which is typical of artists. I right? I can attest to that. Yeah. Um. Uh. Dead end. I I spent the next fifteen twenty years. Uh having two lives and so i had my nine to five and then i had my my theater job so for a lot of my adult life you're working always 60 to 75 hours a week and you you uh you kid yourself by saying we i'm having fun at this other job. <laughs> it's still another job and um uh so I did that for a long time. And then uh, about 13 years ago, I was able to get uh, a day job running a music school and um, that has given me more and more flexibility. Uh, and it's allowed me to 
focused more on my theater. And so I have a, a, a much more rational kind of, of mix between uh, what I do during the day, what I do in the evening. Um, I occasionally see my husband, which is great. I love him. That's nice. I like spending time with him. Um, but, uh, you know, the hope is to eventually be able to create a community theater that does well enough that I can just fully put myself into that. But right now, yeah, I, I do, I do two jobs. Right, right. Have you um have you reached out to other theater directors to kind of pick their brains and see what what they've done that you think maybe I should kind of you know follow his method or maybe I should try and see what she's doing different that I'm not doing? Oh, I mean, yeah. Um, again, it's I mean, Facebook is terrible for a lot of things, but it's pretty good about letting people <laughs> communicate in this in this respect. Um, uh, I would say in the triangle, this is a really typical arrangement. I'm actually probably more privileged because all of my work is arts related. And um, and because after 13 years, I've, I've got um, the flexibility to take a day off to do load in or that kind of thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, it's it's a young theater company and it's still growing. But you know, I, I I really I I really do enjoy talking to to you and to you know other theater directors because it's it's just so it's just so inspiring just to hear how you guys are going from nothing to make you know to making these things work. And, and what's my what's mind boggling is the fact that you know you know when you look at everything on paper, you you just say to yourself, "There's no way that this can work." Oh yeah, but, it's terrifying. Yeah, so, uh, so so it requires a lot of moxie on your end to just make this thing work. And, I mean, do you, do you ever do you ever like just sit there sometimes and just say, "I can't believe we I can't believe we pulled this off." Um, gosh, n no, because I don't think I have time. Um, I'm oh. <laughs> always trying to think about what I need to pull off next, and and to go back to some question that you had asked a while ago. Um, like I want to talk about how expensive theater is. Um, you asked about how we got rights and how we paid for that. And, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, so the rights for Godspell for what we want to do is about $2,500. The, uh, the rent for us to use the space is going to be about six, six to $7,000. Um, our, paying for a small orchestra is probably going to be about two to three thousand dollars this doesn't include the set the costumes the cost of any professionals that we do and again as i said we pay terribly but we, we pay something um and uh so even a small musical it's going to cost about fifteen thousand dollars to produce and um if you're if you're doing well, you can make that back. The venue is the most expensive part. That's the hardest part. If we could do that more more effectively, we could save more money. Right, and 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 I'm and I'm assuming that's also going to influence how many shows you're um, able to put on. Well, yeah, and and honestly, with theater, the more shows you the more shows you do, the cheaper it gets because uh you still have to pay everybody up front before the first show mm -hmm. and um so so there is uh there is a surprising amount of math in managing theater oh yeah yeah yes which i i, I would have told my younger self and like why do i need math i'm like well you need accounting <laughs> <laughs> um just learn quickbooks it's not that hard that's it, right no i learned i learned how to use spreadsheets and how to use formulas and now i never have to math again so formulas kids if you're afraid of math learn learn how to use formulas and then you can just input things and it'll work <laughs> or or at least be familiar with how spreadsheets work because 
you know, that's right. Because because I never thought about using spreadsheets until like ten years ago, and I was like, "This is the best thing ever!" Like, no, Facebook's know. got nothing on this. Yeah, <laughs> no, spreadsheets are amazing, and formulas are amazing, and mm -hmm. I it means I don't have to math. Um, but yeah, you have to be aware of the business side and the budget, and and then you're also constantly begging for money. So, and, so some of that includes like a lot of uh, grant writing, reaching out to yeah. mm -hmm. NC, well, the NC Arts Council, right? Yes, and we we have been a recipient of uh, of grants for the last two years. We're so grateful to the North Carolina Arts Council and the Durham Arts Council for their support. Um, we we wouldn't have been able to purchase the equipment that we need without their their support. Um, we also reach out to local businesses. Uh, we sell advertising in our programs, although that that is changing too because more and more companies are not using physical programs. Um, so that changes how you advertise in them and what you can charge for that. Um, we, yeah, there's there's uh, it's a lot of begging. <laughs> But also, you know, but from from what I've heard from you know film directors and producers, I mean, you you've you've also got to learn how to market yourself as well. Yeah. Right. Because you know, you know because these people, I, I I imagine I imagine you're not the first person to come cap in hand, and you'll probably you certainly wouldn't be the last. No. So you've got to find a way to kind of like sell yourself to where they to where they're willing to open you know loosen the purse strings a little bit, you know. Yeah, for sure. And that's, um, that's a challenge. I mean, my, my talent, <laughs> I'm a director. Uh, and so trying to also run a business and also try to, uh, to get donations and to run fundraisers this is a very wide set of skills. And, um, and I do my best with it. But uh, uh, it, God, it takes many hands. So let me ask you this. So, so say for instance, you know, you know, someone comes up to you and they say, you know, I'm I'm thinking about starting my own theater company. What would be the number one advice I I would need to know, you know, to get started? Uh, don't. Sorry. <laughs> um. So my first my first bit would be self self produce a show. You don't need to start a theater company or start a nonprofit right out the bat. You can self-produce. You can um, you can ask an other theater company with a nonprofit status to let you work under their nonprofit umbrella, which is the way to go probably for the first year, especially if you've never self-produced before. North Carolina is a terrible place for nonprofits, especially for nonprofit theater companies, any, anything that has to do with production or arts. Um, they allow you to do one show per year without having to do taxes. If you wanna do more than that, you've got a lot of reporting issues. You have to report monthly. Uh, it's not friendly. So my thing would be self-produce first, if you want to do it under a nonprofit umbrella, find a nonprofit theater company that is willing to let you do that under their umbrella and see how you feel about it. Because you may end up changing your mind afterwards, right? You might. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, seven times out of 10, I, I feel really great about what we're doing. And three times out of 10, I'm terrified. All right. Right. Yeah. You're probably asking yourself, why did I let myself get into this? You know? I, yeah, and <laughs> and you know, as a board member on a nonprofit, if you if you don't have enough money, it's like, well, what can we personally lend <laughs> or personally give? Mm -hmm. And you know, my husband and I are both educators, and we're paid terribly in this state, so <laughs> um, we do what we can. I mean, that is so fascinating. Um, what you're talking about, uh, you know, the way that the state. Um, incentivizes um you know the arts in north carolina and i and, and i would like to do a future episode where we talk about that in detail because 
because that's something that that rarely comes up in conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Because in, in, because the last time I had a conversation about about this was when I was interviewing Julie Emmons of the Carolina Film Community, mm -hmm. and we were talking about how North Carolina incentivizes uh, filmmaking here, mm -hmm. and 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 you would think the state would you know would do all that it can to try to you know invite film you know film production companies to you know work in North Carolina, but yeah. The incentives it's not the incentives are crap. It's like it used to be really good, and, and yeah, we've got it, these beautiful uh, scenic places from the ocean to the mountains. Um, yeah, and 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 that's, that's what I find so mind-boggling. It's, it's the fact that I mean there is talent in the state, oh, and, yeah. and 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 there are great educational facilities that that try to train the next generation of talent. The problem is, is that we're not doing anything to retain that talent we're i mean i mean we've we're enacting all of these you know legislations that end up screwing ourselves you know yeah. royally and then and then at the end everybody's like well if i if i really really want to pursue my career i either have to move out to california or new york mm -hmm. or georgia really yeah yeah absolutely um i will say though in a in a positive shout out that governor cooper is very supportive um he and his wife actually did a ton of community theater his wife is very very active in doing community theater oh, okay. um yes um they have come to our performances before um we had one of his daughters in our shows they're they're <laughs> lovely uh just a, a at the the first family of North Carolina is incredibly supportive. They they were uh, they gave money to Raleigh Little Theater, um, so good for them. Did you um did you get a chance to kind of nuzzle up to them and be like, hey, you know, maybe you should do something about you know helping out the, the little guy here. You know? Yeah, yeah, you you wish you could, but um, <laughs> well, I mean, well, the daughters in your show. I, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. No, they were, but they were amazing. They were really gracious, and they are active supporters in the arts. And and mm. you don't want to kind of be like, hey, you're already a supporter. How about being a mega supporter? No, it's just like, yeah. thank you, thank you for being for caring. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we can only hope, right? We absolutely. So, Melissa, if, if people want to learn more about uh, Stone Soup Theater or if they want to connect with you, how, how can they do that? Well, they can go to our website at Stone Soup Theater Co. And that's theater with an R-E because we don't have a building, so it's the concept. Right. Uh, and um, there is a way to get a hold of me there. And uh, we are always looking for volunteers. Uh, we are community come audition for us, join our mailing group, um, uh, come be an usher. Uh, it's a great community. It's incredibly supportive. Um, I like to think we're very nice. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Melissa, I am... Um... I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to be on this podcast. And I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to sit and watch this episode. Thank you for making it through. Um, if you're enjoying the content, please leave a like and remember to subscribe for the latest episode drop. And as always, thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.